Um, so today we'll uh, talk about uh, you know, Python concurrency. Um, first, let me introduce uh, myself. My name is uh, Tawa, and uh, I'm open source enthusiast. Uh, I was a MySQL developer before, and uh, previously you know, I was working for GE, IBM Informix. Uh, now I am a freelancer. You know, I do corporate trainings and uh, you know, freelancing work. Um, I have overall 18 years experience. And recently, you know, I'm becoming a Python addict. <clears throat> so in today's uh, talk, uh, mainly we will uh, cover what are the concurrent programming idioms with, uh, you know, what are the uh, multi-threading uh, concurrent programming, how do you do it in Python, um, what are the techniques, and understand its power and understand its limitations, and get a very high level understanding of the big picture with Python, right? Um, it, it's, a, it's a vast, uh, involved uh, subject, so um, so we are not going to uh, gain a lot of uh, minor details uh, within 40 minutes session, but uh, the idea is to get a very good high-level picture, right? Okay, uh, why Python? Um, and we talk about concurrency, and we are saying Python, um, so it's not even a compiled language. So if you are that much you know, performance sensitive, one might think, I will write my you know, application in C. Why do I write it in Python? But um, as, as a matter of fact, uh, Python also has uh, the, the C Python is a reference implementation of Python. Uh, it has something similar to your JVM. It executes the, your bytecode. And overall, uh, the performance of uh, JVM is better than the Python uh, virtual machine. Um, that's for you know, different reasons. You know, a lot of resources have gone into uh, JVM with the you know, just-in-time compiler and, and all that. Uh, but um, having said that, Python is a language with a very high developer productivity and scientific community loves it, right? And it's very easy to write a native extensions in Python compared to your Java or any other language, right? And if you take all this performance sensitive thing and write it in C, and Python is a very good glue language, right? So you, you write all the most performance sensitive things, you just write it in C and put it together Python is a great language as a glue language. It's a scripting language, it's a general purpose language, so it's, it's, you can do anything, right? It's, it's not like you were um, <coughs> mainly web, you know, meant for web programming or anything like that. So as a matter of fact, scientific community loves Python. So you know, if you go to this uh, scipy.org, so people do molecular, biological uh, simulation, uh, in a matrix, uh, multiplication, additions, your simulation, whatever you know, you can imagine. Why? Because you know it's it's so easy to develop and you know, for, you know put together something, rapid prototyping, uh, exploring. You know, it's it's you know, amazing, amazing stuff, right? And um, <clears throat> and also there are um, native uh, Python implementations in the sense. You can take your Python code and compile it to the machine language. So that is the uh, PyPy, uh, which uh, does the just-in-time compiler. And also there is a Cython. Uh, so it is a slight extension of uh, Python. You just give some type hints. Then it converts your uh, Python program to a C or C++ program. Then it compiles it onto your native platform. So it becomes really as good as a C program. So you get to code in a very high level language. At the same time, you get to execute in, in a platform in a most efficient way, whatever you can imagine. Right? It's like having a cake and you can eat it too. So, um, so this is why you know, Python is, is really hot. You know, everybody loves it. And um, more than anything, as a glue language, also as a framework, um, you have to be aware of the concurrency limitations, right? So how it does the things, 
because the concurrency is the um, this is center piece of attention, right? Because you, you put together these things, how this is going to exactly interact together. Is it an efficient way to do it? Or is it okay? So you need to have very good high level you know, overview or, or a feel of it, you know, how this, this piece works. All right, so now let us set some terminology. So we say concurrency and then parallelism. So, in general, there is a subtle difference between this terminology. So, we define concurrency is something occurring at the same time. For example, I am typing my lap laptop or I am writing. So, these two actions are concurrent. So, I am typing for some time and writing for some time. But I am not doing writing and typing at the same time. So, it is not really parallel, but these two things are concurrent. So when I say concurrent, you know, it, it happens. It may be parallel or it may not be parallel. But when I say parallel, it's exactly parallel. So this is happening here, this is happening here, right? So that is a general terminology you know, that we'll use um, going forward. That's, that's an accepted, you know, fairly accepted terminology. So a multitasking is concurrent, right? So you do this for some time, and you stop doing this. You do this for some time. Then you stop doing this, and you do it for you know some other time. <clears throat> so that is a concurrent thing. Okay. So let us uh, review some very basic stuff. Well, yeah. Yeah. So what I meant is, uh, if something is parallel, it is necessarily concurrent in the sense like. You know, some two things are going. So you know, two cars are you know, it's, it's going in parallel, and and it and that means it is necessarily you know concurrent. Now parallelism implies concurrency, but the concurrency does not imply parallelism. Okay, it, it's just a terminology. So you know, in general, you might mean synonymously, but for our discussion or in general. Uh, you know, this is an accepted terminology. When we say concurrent, a multitasking is concurrent, but it a parallelism. You know, we mean real parallelism. Okay. Okay. So let us review some basic stuff. Um, whatever we learned in our you know OS uh, course. Um, so we have the process, we have threads, and uh, then we have processors. Um, this is in uh, Linux uh, and, and even you know, in Solaris. So basically, um, Linux has this concept of lightweight process. Say a lightweight process is something the OS knows about it. A process is something the OS knows about it. And a, a thread is something the OS may or may not know about it. So in the sense, a thread is uh, typically, if you are writing a C program, you know you use a pthread library, right? So you you say pthread create and, and and all that stuff. Then basically, most of the typical implementation, uh, it makes a system call. So every pthread, the OS knows what a thread is, what your thread is, right? And uh, typically, um, so if if that is the implementation, then 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 we say. Um, you know, it's the OS aware thread. So the every thread may be directly bound to a lightweight process, or it can be loosely bound to a lightweight process. So your lightweight process takes up the thread, and you know, it runs for it. I mean, runs it, and the OS knows about it, and the OS is the one who which is scheduling your threads. Uh, so all those you know um, uh, fun things are happening under the hood, right? But there is also another thing called user threads. So uh, before uh, uh, some of the primitive applications or the most sophisticated applications, you may write a library to implement a thread, and the OS has no clue about it. So the OS might think it is a single thread. And it is a complete in library user space you can implement your threads. So it's called user threads. For example, you may think, you know, whenever I execute a function routine f, it is thread 1. So whenever I execute this g, it is thread 2. 
it's your notion, right? You may think. Then, um, as I said, a concurrent is, concurrency is also thread. So thread doesn't mean that it has to necessarily execute in parallel, right? So you do this for some time, f, and then from there, you know, you jump, you go do this in g, then, uh, you know, you may think I'm executing two threads. You know, it's your, your assumption, your notion, right? So you have your thread, so you, you run multiple threads. As a matter of fact, um, most of these, uh, you know, databases like Oracle, Informix, uh, so they implement uh, their own thread library. So they, that's what we call it as a cooperative multitasking. So they have their own thread library. Why do, they, why do they have their own thread library? Is because it provides you exact deterministic behavior. Because you know you, you execute it for some time, then you want to uh, do the thread switch. So you are not at the mercy of the OS. So if you are doing that, you know your database will run perfectly fine on Linux, but you will have a horrible performance on Solaris. So so to avoid all that. So many of um, the databases and, and, and some of the uh, you know um, high performance system, you may want to implement your own user level threads, and uh, thread switching from one place to other it doesn't happen arbitrarily. So you decide when to yield and when not to yield, right? So periodically uh, in your program you may call a yield, then it will check if there is any other thread is uh, you know running then automatically it will jump there, right? So a simple mechanism of a thread could be as simple as, uh, you know, you say function f1 is thread 1, function f2 is thread 2, then periodically you call a function called yield. So whenever, uh, you know, you call yield, so if f2 is ready to run, so you may jump there. Then, you know, then you, after some time you call yield, then you say, okay, now f1 is waiting for you, then you jump, right? So this is how, at a very uh, high level, at the library level, you know, you can implement your threads. That's called user threads. Okay, so this is the very basic, uh, basic stuff. And uh, let us see how this, you know, address space is laid out. So the left we have a single threaded system, and the right you have a multi-threaded system. So uh, you have a single stack in a single threaded system, and if your process is multi-threaded, uh, it shares your code, it shares your data, it shares your heap, but it has a different thread stock, right? So every thread has got a little bit of, you know, uh, a thread stock. So, um, so that is a you know, very, very important uh, concept. And uh, conventionally, uh, we also uh, say that a stack has to be contiguous. Contiguous in the sense uh, at the virtual memory level. So this is all virtual memory. I mean, it's not a physical frame. Your physical frame can be, you know, distributed. Yeah. So it is a perfectly, you know, virtual. Um, but even though it's a virtual, suppose you know you have 4 GB memory, right? So you may run out of, you know, virtual memory address space. Suppose you know you you have too many threads, thousands of threads, ten thousands of threads, and every thread should have, typically, you know, you don't know. You may be calling a recursive program, so you allocate you know 500 kilobytes or one megabytes. I don't know. So you allocate you know every thread, um, you know, uh, a big stack. Yeah. No. Okay. You know, it doesn't matter whether I you know uh, use a three-dimensional or two-dimensional, but the sum of all that I'm running out of space. That's what I'm saying. So suppose I have four GB, right? And the every thread, suppose you decide to allocate one megabyte, then I can at most have 4,000 threads, right? So 4,000 threads, each thread having one megabyte, your entire address space is gone. So nobody is really running. I mean, the physical memory is free. Maybe 3 GB is free. But you don't have the virtual address space, right? You can't even ha allocate it. So that's a problem. So, um, so yeah, so just be aware that the concept of, so why do we have this, you know, the stack has to be contiguous? Because of the simplicity, we always said that a stack is, you know, uh, it is contiguous, you make a function call, then you return back, when you return back, you know, you, you pop the thing from the stack and jump there, right? It's a very fairly simple thing. 
But actually, you know, every stack frame has to be contiguous. The entire stack need not be contiguous if you really think about it, right? So, uh, so that's why, uh, because all you need to do is you, you make a function call. When you return it, you, you go to some place and you take the return address and jump there. So that's all we need to do. So your stack could be a linked list or it could be a tree. It could be anything. As long as you can traverse back and you know how to get back, it can be anything, right? So we will see that, you know, uh, the stack having to be contiguous, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem in the sense like sometimes it could be a problem for scaling, right? So we'll take a closer look at that later. Now that, you know, we'll uh, just remember managing all this stack and, and thread, you know, thread stack can be a challenging thing, right? So this is how, you know, it looks a single threaded thing and, and a multi-threaded thing. So, um, so let's say, so a process, then we talked about, talked about the OS thread, which is basically a lightweight process. Then there is a user thread, we talked about that. And a process is costly, and OS threads is also not free. And the user threads is really good if you manage properly. I mean, because it's, it's all your library routine, right? The OS, you don't even make a system call. You know, you, you jump from one function call to another function call, then you can call that as a thread switching. So it cannot be faster than that, right? So if you manage the user threads properly, it is the most efficient thing you can imagine. OK, so your pthread C library creates the user space threads. So we use the terminology when we say user space, it is a user space versus the kernel space, right? So it is not the user threads. So when I say user thread, so not even the LWP coming into the picture, not even the pthread is coming to the picture. It's a completely you know, a different library which maintains this, the so-called threads, right? So, uh, so just we need to remember the OS threads can do a preemptive scheduling, and the user threads it's a cooperative scheduling. A cooperative scheduling is a little bit uh, more difficult to program, but in the in the sense like you know you have to make sure you are yielding properly and all that. But it provides a deterministic behavior, uh, which is really good, and and also. Um, the locking and deadlocking, all the, all those things, analyzing it much easier because you, you have a fairly static deterministic behavior of the whole thing because you know exactly when things are getting yielded, when things are you know uh, getting switched and so on. Okay, so let's look at your life of a ta task. So you you run for some time, there is an I/O, then you run for some time, then you then there is an I/O and and all that stuff. So um, typically when the I.O. is happening, the O.S. You know, takes the thread and puts it into the sleep. And the I.O. is happening between the, probably the direct memory access from your I.O. device, the file, or whatever it is. So the CPU is not involved. So your file reading is being taking place from the hard disk to the memory. And the CPU is, is just a spectator. So that is the time if there is another thread is waiting, you know, it can be scheduled. Okay, so uh, a very quick refresher on the you know thread synchronization mechanisms. So threads use mutex locks, condition variables, and shared memory. So um, these are all the common you know primitives that we use to synchronize, and often a source of complexity and bugs. Suppose you have some two locks or three locks. Even then, you have to carefully analyze. Okay, you know, is there a deadlock? Can I probably I lock this, and and I will never release it. So will it be a problem? You know. So it it kind of uh, after uh, if you do too many locks, it becomes like a nightmare. It's like a puzzle. Your, your whole program is like a you know difficult puzzle to solve. And there is some error handling. You return some error happen without releasing the lock. You know. So welcome to the you know. Uh, deadlock. So uh, then we use the message based communications. A message based communication is uh, much more simpler in terms of a concept. Even for threads also, you know, it, if you use it, it simplifies the whole thing because you know, every time you just imagine there is a message queue, 
you just put it and somebody else comes and takes it so you know there is not uh, the complexity is much better when you deal with you know message messages then the processes use pipes and the shared memory and sockets and and so on so if there is a distributed system you have to use sockets right because you know there is one machine here then there is one machine here they are remote so the only way you communicate is by you know sockets let's okay so now let us look at the python threads so this is how it looks uh, it's somewhat similar to your uh, java threads if you are familiar with java uh, but you, you take any global function or or whatever then you create a thread and uh, by the way uh, python doesn't have a new keyword so whenever you want to create it you just call that uh, you know thread then you you know let it go right so then you 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 say join then it waits until the thread uh, terminates this is one version there is also another version uh, which is uh, which looks more like uh, your java um so you you define a class and inherit from thread then you define a run method then you, you initiate that thread and and you say run then the thread starts running right so so this is how a typical um, you know a thread in 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 python uh, looks like so python provides a fairly good amount of uh, you know uh, primitives for the synchronization you know whatever you can imagine uh, it is there uh, so what is the main difference between this and and uh, c so most of these primitives you will see it provides a little bit of a higher uh, abstraction so in c you will always you know messing up with the pointer your bytes and here and there so we'll see here um, a little bit of a better higher level abstraction it it's kind of a more pleasant to deal with right so we will we will see all the see all that uh, one by one uh, so lock and a reentrant lock and semaphore and an event mechanism and and a condition um, condition right condition variable so this is how a mutex lock uh, look like so you just say lock you create a lock and you say acquire then your uh, critical section whatever you want to do you can do then you can say release <clears throat> so that is one way of uh, you know doing it then uh, later uh, fairly recently uh, python introduced a with statement so this is a more uh, better way to do things uh, compared to uh, you know directly acquiring a lock what the with does uh, is that uh, you you say uh, with a lock then do something so a lock or any other object uh, if it uh, enters two primitives something like a enter callback and a exit callback enter and you know exit or whatever um, i don't remember the exact name but that's the functionality it has to provide two callbacks and whenever there is an exception which happens within the with uh, call block automatically it gets called so you know you release whatever you want to do you release it and whenever you enter it automatically the lock happens uh, so so it's much more pleasant to use uh, more uh, robust um, so it it's kind of preferred compared to the the other lock okay so then we have a reentrant uh, lock a reentrant lock is something like if you have a same thread the same thread can lock it again and again so that is a reentrant lock um typically a mutex lock you know if you already locked it then you try to lock it then it will be a problem right why a reentrant lock would be um, needed uh, suppose uh, you know you 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 are the process you own it you know uh, and there are few call you know few routines then uh, imagine a recursive call or recursive like call you know you, you you lock that object you do something else then that one recursively calls you back then you try to lock it so basically you won't because you know what you are doing you are the owner and you, know, you are the thread and multiple times if you want to lock you may want to let it go i mean let it uh, allow right but if you use a mutex lock not only you have to remember uh, you own it but you have to remember who owns it and and you know it becomes uh, a kind of messy so that's the time the reentrant lock will be useful uh, it allows you to lock the owner multiple times but uh, yeah, how many number of times you lock it that many number of times you have to release it right 
OK. Then we have. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Reentrant lock. Yeah. So a reentrant lock is uh, suppose a thread uh, locks an object, right? Where exactly it is useful? Okay. Um, <clears throat> suppose. Okay. Suppose I have a class in which I define some four or five methods. Then. Whenever somebody calls that method, I, I lock it, right? Then those calls make other calls. So in general, every method does a lock, but there can be a chance that I go, I call one method and that method calls another method. So I may try to lock twice, okay? It's, it's very common, right? So when I try to lock twice, if it is a mutual uh, lock, then it won't allow you. If it is a reentrant lock, it will allow you as long as the owner is same. So you can twice lock, a owner can lock it twice, then uh, the owner will have to remember it to release it twice. Right? So it is a kind of you know, more easier to program that way. Okay. So then the counting semaphore, it is a very common uh, in a concept. Uh, so you can have a, a counting semaphore. Uh, typically, if there are five resources or n resources, then you start with the n, and whenever the consumer, it is, so the n represents the producer, and the resources is the n resources are there. So the consumer every time uses it, then you know uh, they release it, so and, and so on, right? So so this is uh, so whenever you do an acquire, it is like a consuming. Whenever you release it, it's like producing. Okay, so then we have these events. So uh, event can, it's a very small set of interface, but very efficient and useful. Um, you can set an event to be true or clear it, or you can wait on a particular event, all right? So e dot wait, and whenever they set it, then, then you know, you'll unblock, right? So this is the event, uh, very simple, straightforward uh, stuff. Then we have this condition variable. This condition variable is also a universal uh, concept. It's, it's the same thing in, in uh, Python as well. The formatting got a little bit uh, screwed up. I didn't get a chance to you know, uh, see the thing, but it's fine. So I'll, I'll explain it, you know, how it uh, works. Um, a condition variable is, is a combination of a lock and, and a D signal. Um, so you, you not only, uh, you, you say that, okay, a, a condition variable is always associated with a lock, right? So underlying a condition variable, there is a lock. So, um, so you can say, okay, until this thing is done, I am going to wait, right? So when you are waiting, you will just, you know, give up your lock, then wait. Then the other guy, is, uh, so imagine there is a producer and the consumer. So they are strictly, wor you know, working in tandem. So this guy keeps producing, and this guy, you know, keep um, consuming and go and you know, uh, and and so forth. So between this and this, we don't want to miss a beat. So if you use some kind of a lock, you know, you release the lock, then you do an if condition, then you do something, then there is a race condition. So, uh, but if you want to coordinate uh, these two guys, producer and consumer, condition variable is the way to go. So it's, it's the same thing concept in uh, C in uh, everywhere, right? Um, so uh, you know you, you say wait, then the other guy produces, and they say notify, then then you come back and, and all that stuff. Okay. Now, what are the common problems? So uh, with uh, all these threads and everything, deadlocks are easy to create. It is difficult to debug. debug. Then it is a non-deterministic scheduling, which brings its own challenges. Um, you know, it's, it's a source of uh, lost sleep. Okay. Now, we also have uh, queues. Uh, Python provides you with the queues. Um, it is uh, whatever you will imagine. Um, you, you initialize a queue. You, you put an item, and uh, you get it. And you can check whether the queue is empty or, or full. 
So as I said, working with queues is much more pleasant experience compared with working with locks and, and, and stuff. Right? So it's, it's a, whenever you can, so you know, it's, it's, a, it's simpler and easier to use. OK. So then Python threads performance. Let us see. Interestingly, Python performance on CPU bound threads is bad. Bad in the sense like I am uh, referring to uh, the C Python which is a Python reference implementation. Um, so if you have two CPU bound tasks, so you try to use thread, it runs more slowly than a sequential execution of the two uh, you know, uh, threads. So you suppose you, you have a CPU bound task for one second and uh, you know, another CPU bound task for two seconds, you use threads, then you are going to take more than two seconds which is unfortunate because uh, the reason for that is because the Python uses a global interpreter lock um, in, the, in the standard reference implementation which does not let you to uh, execute two Python uh, byte code at the same time. So basically it sequences, I mean it uh, s makes your entire flow sequential. So you are not really gaining anything but however most of our program is I.O. bound. Uh, so your I.O. bound tasks are perfectly fine. So it is not that you know threads are necessarily evil in Python. Uh, it is okay. Uh, but this is something you know you have to uh, remember. And, and as a matter of fact uh, JVM does not do that. So your Java uh, JVM uh, which has got uh, you know threading really they, you know, did it very well you know from the bottom up. So it was uh, designed well. It is a true you know concurrency. Uh, yeah, I mean even JVM initially they had these uh, you know user level threads, then later you know, nowadays you know, every JVM implements the uh, native threads. Okay, so this is the CPU bound threads. Uh, it is it's, it's an example, so which uh, you know illustrates you do it sequentially, then you measure the time, then um, then you do it in parallel using threads and you measure it you will find that you know uh, using threads it executes slower. Then we talk about, um, so I will try to you know speed up a little bit because um, yeah we do not have much time. Um, so, so the global interpreter lock you know it talks about you know why, uh, why, the, why it is there. It is there because it makes your implementation easier and native uh, you know extensions are easy to write. It is a kind of an excuse, we have to fix it. And the GIL is not a global problem, and there are implementation of Python which doesn't have this problem. Interestingly, the Windows implementation doesn't have this problem, the IN Python, uh, and also there is a Jython. Jython is a uh, implementation uh, which compiles your Python code into JVM, and uh, and also all your Java libraries is available in Jython. So Jython doesn't have this problem of global interpreter lock. So, uh, so basically, you know, if you want to leverage all the CPUs, uh, it's a well-known mechanism is that you have few CPU, you know, processes running, and every process runs as many threads as possible. So, if you want to get a maximum out of a four-processor machine, typically you run some four processes and bind these process to a processor, and that process itself runs in you know, a multiple threads in in parallel. So that is an idea. I mean, typically you want this combination of process and threads to squeeze maximum out of you know your hardware yeah uh, uh, no the cpu i mean the python doesn't provide uh, any kind of an api to say that you know, i want to bind to this cpu no it doesn't provide this api <coughs> um, okay but uh, in, you will see that you know in python we have uh, some other uh, you know uh, approach in which we can really write a very efficient program so we will see that so threading, we said it's a kind of not really good, but there are a lot of, lot of high-level abstractions Python offers, which makes your multi-thread programming really a breeze. So, uh, so in Python allows you to pickle to serialize your object, and it's a, as you know, it's it's very simple in a couple of calls. 
Then the Python provides you very high level IPC mechanisms like a pipe sockets, libraries, and, and so on. Then, uh, then process handling is really good with Python because we know most of the time uh, threats is not that efficient. Then you have these libraries to, to deal with process. You can almost treat a process like a thread. I mean, you can uh, create a process pool. You can uh, join you know, and wait for the process to die. And a lot of these abstractions are very, uh, very easy to use. Um, so there is a multi-processing module. So there is a, you know, you can almost treat the process like a thread. Then there is a pipes. So uh, a pipe in Python and a pipe in Unix and then C, the main difference is that uh, a, a pipe is like a byte stream. It is a stream in you know, C program. But in uh, Python, it allows you to have a little bit higher abstraction. It's an object. So even though it's a pipe, you know, you put the objects, and when you receive it, you know, you read the objects, which is kind of you know much much better to use. And of course, you you have message queues in in um, in Python. Then we have, as I mentioned briefly, we have a process pool like a thread pool. You can have a process pool and get the things done. <clears throat> okay. So now we are getting more to the more interesting part of the talk. So when you want to do something you know, more efficiently, there are mainly few approaches. How do you do it? You know, the thread, how this, that. So there are mainly you know, two or three different approach. One is the event-driven asynchronous approach, which involves a callback. And another one is a cooperative multitasking, which is called coroutines. Coroutine is similar to subroutine, but the two routines are like a pairs. They are not one is not the you know um, sub of the other. So the both are you know like a pair. So it's it's a very powerful concept. It's not a very new. It it has existed in you know, many other languages before, but uh, none of the mainstream uh, languages uh, you know have it. So and, and it's a wonderful concept. You know that you will see uh, uh, in a more you know, other examples. Then there is another model called actors-based model in which everything is an actor. They communicate through you know, messages. So this is also a very good uh, concept which kind of simplifies your entire uh, approach of the designing the complex system. OK, so Asyncore is a module in Python which lets you to do an asynchronous level program. It is a very small networking library. Um, basically allows you to uh, write an asynchronous, you provide a you know, set of callbacks, when something is done, you, you know, your callbacks is executed. So it's, it's, all, you know, it's, it's as simple as that. It's a very minimal library, a core library, which allows you to write a program in an asynchronous style. Then you welcome to the world of coroutines. Coroutines is a very powerful concept very modern approach to write a parallel um, parallelism in your entire logic. Um, it is like subroutines, as I mentioned, uh, but at a pair level. So this is how it uh, looks like. So the entire coroutine, really a single thread of execution, executes you know two routines. So roughly speaking, a coroutine is a mechanism in which you can have the go to across functions. So typically, you know, your C program or no program allows go to across a function calls, right? So it's, it's a roughly speaking, a coroutine is a mechanism in which, so if you are familiar with a C, there is a set jump, long jump, and all that. But the set jump, long jump is a system call. You know, it, it is costly, right? But this one, it is almost like a user level. You know, you, from here, you make a jump there. Now you, you count down. Uh, so count down, you know, if you see, it is a function which yields an integers, right? Then you use that function as an iterator within your for loop. So when I say for x in this function call, that function call returns an iterator. That iterator starts producing an integer. So, so now since I have a while loop, basically that function will uh, produce, keep on producing the integers until the end reaches zero, right? So 
we call such a function as a generator because it generates a sequence of numbers. So very simple concept, but it is so powerful. It's very, very powerful, right? So why it is powerful? Because you make a function call and the function returns a value, but it preserves the state. Next time you, you ask that function, give me another value, it just continues from where it left off, right? So if you can re-enter the function multiple times and it remembers exactly where it was before and from there you know, it continues. So it's a kind of you know, making an you know, arbitrary jumps across you know, a function call. So that is why it's so powerful and so cool. So when you have a generator, typically there is a kind of a parent-child relationship. So your parent is a caller and, and the child is the guy who is generating it, right? Then later what they did, they mailed the I mean, yield statement as an yield expression. So we'll see an example and uh, that will be easier. So if you see, this is a coroutine because earlier if you do a ping is a function, it is like a generator, but it's a generator which returns the yield statement, returns a value. So what does that mean? That means you, you can have a two-way communication between your generator and a caller. So, so far the caller calls the generator and the other guy gives only one value. But in coroutine, you can also give a value. So, you get a value, then you send some value, then the coroutine produces another value. So, almost a conversation is taking place between two coroutines, right? So, that is a very, you know, rough um, concept, but it's a very powerful concept, right? So, there are amazing things you can do with coroutines. You can create a pipeline of tasks, you can create filters, you can create a tree like broadcast in a broadcast pipeline. You can implement a state machine because you know from this state to that state to that state, you know, you can implement a stat, state machine. It is somewhat similar to your object oriented programming, but it does it more simpler. And the most importantly, it provides you a deterministic control flow. You are not at the mercy of the operating system or anyone. And also, uh, since you know exactly how the control flows through, most of the time you can get away without you know, using any locks at all. Because you know from here to here to here, that's how I jump and I don't really need any lock. Right? Okay, so now we saw there are two, three different ways of approaching a problem. A synchronous, asynchronous, a coroutine, and, and all the stuff, right? So let us see, you know, which one is uh, better. So the classical example, you know, you take an Apache. Apache uses a process and set of threads. Then you, you look at the NGINX. NGINX is the high performance. Uh, it is a reverse proxy first, and also it's a web server. So NGINX uses an asynchronous model, an asynchronous callback model, right? And um, NGINX scales far, far better than Apache. There is no comparison, right? So that is why asynchronous model is, is the one, is the, you know, is, the, is the one to go with. It's very efficient, you know, it, it's, uh, it's wonderful. Uh, if you are thinking in terms of threads, and often, you know, asynchronous model is the right way to go if you really want to scale, right? But you are not worried about scaling, uh, then most of the time, just look at your program, whatever is, you know, complexly, I mean, conceptually simpler, you just go with that, right? So we are not going to complicate our life just to because one technology is better than the other technology, but we always look at the problem on the hand, right? Okay, so when all these web servers came, there was a, this famous C10K problem. What is the C10K problem? It is like a concurrent 10,000 web, web server connections problem. So for the, the goal of these web servers, how do I serve 10,000 concurrent connections, right? So it was not possible at that time. Now, now it is possible. Now we can have um, even your laptop uh, with a slightly higher end model, so you can serve 10,000 threads connections at a time. So you have come very far. Um, <clears throat> 
So the asynchronous uh, programming, so uh, non-blocking with callbacks is the, the theme. And um, so you do <clears throat> in a select poll or KQ or whatever is the most you know, efficient on your operating system, you, know, you can use that. Then there is something called a stackless Python. A stackless Python is the one variation of a Python implementation in which they do not use uh, interpreter stacks to execute your Python threads, I mean Python uh, code, right. So it so happens that the Python reference implementation, when it executes a Python logic, it uses the interpreter uh, stack, so which creates a problem when you are scaling, right. So the, your stackless Python implementation you know, removes that uh, logic. So it uses a separate heap for the stack of the user threads. So that is why you know, it scales really well. Um, it is a, it's a very interesting uh, you know, uh, concept, very deep, so we cannot uh, you know, go deep on that, so I will skip over. It just to you know, uh, good to remember um, there is such an you know, implementation which exists. So, so this is the synchronous task and you know, this is the asynchronous task, so you, know, you keep on getting a call back, it is the one thread of execution. And, and stackless is the, as I said, uh, it is an implementation uh, in which um, the Python threads does not use the interpreter stack, you know, it uses the another you know, stack or a heap. So, um, so uh, what the C Python reference implementation guys have done, they have taken a subset of a stackless Python implementation and they merged it to the C Python which is called Greenlet. The Greenlet is a very lightweight thread which is very good for scaling, right. So, so that the Greenlet is, is, a, is a very good thing to do, um, very good thing to use. Then the best Python asynchronous framework, okay. So these are the framework library, uh, the very well known framework library uh, used with Python. Uh, there is a twisted, it is almost like a de facto standard. So, you know, the most famous one and there is a tornado which is used by Facebook, uh, it feeds the, you know, uh, uh, front finder uh, uh, website. Then there is a G event uh, which uh, uses Greenlet uh, underneath, it is basically a lib event based high performance network library, right. And there is a concurrence, there is a circuits, then a diesel web and there is a cogen, right. So each one is uh, very interesting on its own way. So, but as you take a look, Python provides a very rich varieties of framework, uh, which are very interesting to look at. So G event, um, so we are running out of time, so I am just uh, skipping it. Uh, it is one of the very modern framework, very you know, good. Uh, so Twisted is a de facto and Tornado is a very fast one. Uh, the actor model, model is a very popular framework, uh, ACA is a framework in Scala and there is a corresponding uh, PyCA uh, in Python uh, which is, which implements a very small subset of ACA framework, okay. So now we are, we have to finish now and all this slide is available on my website, it is in zatvia.com, so you can um, you know look at it later, right. So. Okay, perfect. So uh, you have to just remember zatvia.com. You can access the slides. Yeah, I'll upload it.